Hello and welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from the beautiful Lake District in Northern England. We're here to discover all of the hard work that goes into conserving the region, but also coming up on this week's show. Carmen continues her whistle-stop tour of next year's Rugby World Cup venues in Japan. This time, she's in Osaka. Ferris wheel. Masugu? Arigato! Okay, she said it straight ahead. Our global guru, Simon, is here with tips on how to make it to base camp on Mount Everest. And we find out where ice cream is said to have originated. New York, Italia. Its vast lakes and majestic mountains have inspired generations of painters, poets and writers. The Lake District is England's largest national park, and that's where we're starting our show this week. And we're not on our own. Almost 20 million people annually visit this region, and last year the Lake District was awarded UNESCO World Heritage status, which means it now counts among wonders like the Grand Canyon in the US or Machu Picchu in Peru. That's pretty good company for a region whose steep mountains and picturesque valleys and lakes have been attracting tourists for over 200 years, come rain or shine. So the great thing about coming to this place at this time of year is the beautiful autumnal colours filling up the landscape. The bad thing is the autumn weather. Liam Pryor is a local ranger. UNESCO's recognition is filling people like him with great pride but this will inevitably add to an existing concern. In total then, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people each year coming up to these mountains. That must have an impact on the land. Absolutely. Every footfall causes a little bit of erosion um, and the landscape would be, uh, would be a much different place if, if that erosion wasn't tackled. Thankfully, Fix the Fells formed to tackle the erosion. Every week, whatever the weather, volunteers gather to maintain and repair the mountain paths fix walls and protect the unique landscape. And there's plenty to keep them busy. You can actually see here that the original width of the path is about a metre wide, and yet now it stretches almost to three metres. And that's been caused by erosion from footfall, people stepping off the path to walk around rocks, and also rainfall off the mountain. Making the preservation work all the more urgent. And it's tough work. Cleaning the drains and rebuilding the path edges needs stamina, plenty of elbow grease and good shovel skills. All right, chaps, what's happening here? Uh, so basically what we'd want to do is just extend this drain out a little bit, but just to give it a little bit more flow when it gets into heavy rain. Okie dokie. Good to go. Let's, let's do it. I think this is actually the first time I've ever used a shovel. So. You did a great job. <laughs> Barry and his dog Hamish have also been volunteering for the past 10 years. Oh, you're looking a bit wet and miserable. He comes out most times. <laughs> Hamish has uh, been doing it since he was a pup. The things that keep me coming back are, well, firstly, there's a huge amount of camaraderie amongst the, 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 the whole group. Another reason is I've walked on these fells for, well, years, all my life, basically. And uh, it's a way of putting something back. As the sky clears, I leave the volunteers to their hard work and take up Liam's offer of a tour up Scuffle Pike. At 978 metres, it's England's highest mountain. I can't imagine how much labour must have gone into putting this pathway up the side of the mountain. Well, there's been a footpass team in Wasdale since 1988, so every year since then work has gone into this path. To create, to create the sustainable life. So it's what, 30 years of hard labour? More than 30 years of hard labour, yeah. <laughs> it's more than a jail sentence. It's amazing. <laughs> but here the hard labour is rewarded by stunning views. It may not be the best of weather today. It's a bit misty out there, but you can still see out to this incredible view over the lake. And it's not surprising that so many people are drawn here all year round. 
We march on and after a couple of hours we finally reach the top. Well, the plateau lying just below it. So, where is the peak? Oh, so these are crags are Scarfell Pike with the summit just nestled in behind. And I believe there's some rock climbing history here, right? Yeah, sure. It's uh, the disputed home of, of rock climbing in England. A lot of people came and tested their skills on these crags in the, in the late 1800s. But these seemingly eternal rocks have also lived through world events. After the climbers came the soldiers. After the First World War, Scarfell Pike was, was gifted to the National Trust as a war memorial and as a place for um, returning servicemen and women to come and get away from it all. And we'd encourage everybody to show that kind of respect when they're, when they're ascending Scarfell Pike. Conservation efforts in the Lake District aren't just focused on the landscape. Up until a few years ago, you could catch glimpses of large golden eagles towering over these summits. But now, the only place you can find them is here, at Dee and Daniel's place. This is Phoenix. Hello, Phoenix. But you're not a Phoenix. <laughs> the Golden Eagle is really the icon of the Lake District in terms of its natural wilderness. Sadly, the last Golden Eagle died uh, about two or three years ago. Wow. Um, in the wild. So, um, this little chap has been trained up to fly uh, free fly in the lakes so people can still see a wild golden eagle in its natural environment. The Lake District is not immune to the global decline in biodiversity and Dee and Daniel's ecotourism business introduces people to animals which are or were once part of this region's wildlife. All with the hope of fostering further respect for these creatures and their habitat. Another animal you're no longer able to spot in the wild here in the Lake District is the wolf. In fact, the last one is believed to have been killed way back in the 13th century, just up the road from here. But for Dee's hybrid wolves, whose pedigree is part wolf, part dog, it's time for walkies. Put your hand all the way through the leash and grip like this, and then we'll just take him for a walk. All right, take your wolf for a walk. We want to show people that they're not the big bad wolf the demonisation of Hollywood and fairy tales <laughs> yeah. um, isn't actually true. And although it's not a, a suitable place in the Lake District to have wolves anymore, it, we can use that to show people that actually coexistence with the predators we've got left is really, really vitally important. And as the sun goes down, my time here is up. But Dee tells me there's one thing I've got to take part in to become a true member of the pack. There's lots of different wolf howls. The one that we're going to do is a family bonding howl. And this bonds the pack unity. It's our version of singing, we are family. And I've got all my wolf pack around me. Oh. With some good howling boys. Nicely done. <laughs> Time now to leave the Lake District behind and find out about a tasty treat that's a traditional favourite over in Iran. می که بستنی اولین بار کجا ساخته شده؟ راستش نه نیویورک یا نیویورک ایتالیا فکر کنم ایتالیا بوده ما الان در یکی از ساختارهای معماری شاخص مناطق کبیری ایران در خدمت شما هستیم
فالوده ترکیبی از نشاسته و شیره ای هستش که گرفته می شده به همراه یخ قبل از اینکه این دستگاه ها وارد بشه یه پاتی لایی بود توش یخ می ریختن بعد یه پاتی لی دیگه ای توش می داشتن شیره می ریختن یه حرکت دورانی بهش میدادن بعد حرارت حرارت انتقال پیدا میکرد و بستنی شروع شد به شیر شروع شد به بلور شدن و بستنی شدن این خیلی زمانگیر بود خیلی زحمت داشت برای همین کم کم این تکنولوژی رفت خارج تکنولوژی ایران چون بستنی اول مال ایران بود بعد رفت ایتالیا و این دستگاه با تولید شد و جایگز مینش دوباره برگشت ایران یکی از قدیمی ترین بستنی توش های اسمان هستیم ما ترکیباتش شکره، شیره، اگه شیره گوز کنده قاتش باشه خیلی عالی میشه زفرانه، گلابه زاقه ایرانی ها و امریکایی ها بسیار بستنی های چرب و شیری دوست دارن ولی اروپایی ها بستنی های کم مزه و کم چرب، چربیش کم تر باشه بیشتر دوست میدارن این بهش میگن خوش کن بستنی منفی ده درجه، این رو منفی سی درجه بستنی آماده یه عرض است بستنی بارش داده میشه بفرم Well, don't go anywhere because coming up on the travel show We head over to Japan as Carmen continues her challenge to explore one of the country's most famous cities in 90 minutes This time, it's Osaka I gotta walk there No, that way. Hello from Malaga. This week, I've advised on trekking to Everest Base Camp, and the friendliest places on the planet, according to a Californian professor of psychology. First though, in Belgium, the Africa Museum has reopened almost five years to the day after it closed for a complete renovation. The grand venue, originally known as the Palace of the Colonies, is set in Parkland in the south of the Belgian capital, Brussels. The original name was the Museum of the Belgian Congo and much of the contents were brought from what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. The aim of the refreshed museum? To present a contemporary and decolonized vision of Africa. Next, Sami Alalawi from Bahrain sends an email with the heading A Hospitable Place to Visit. Could you suggest a place to travel where the local inhabitants are friendly and accommodating, since I might travel alone to such a place? Sammy, an American professor of psychology has done the work for you by researching the most friendly cities on the planet. The top placed cities are in Latin America, Rio in Brazil and San Jose in Costa Rica. More conveniently, from your starting point in Bahrain, Lilongwe in Malawi and Kolkata in India are third and fourth respectively. But personally, I find your part of the world, the Middle East, is the region on Earth where I've felt most warmly welcomed. Next, Andrew Moga from West Yorkshire has an adventure in mind. It has always been my ambition to trek to the Everest Base Camp. What would you recommend for me to achieve this? This is a real trip of a lifetime, Andrew, and requires some specialist advice. It's a very achievable goal for someone in their mid to even late 60s and into their 70s with a well thought out plan. Get your gear list, start to accumulate the gear because that probably takes a little bit of time. You want to start to physically prepare yourself. You'll want to focus on strength training, cardiovascular training, and endurance training. Finally, Gillian Craigie plans to arrive at New York's JFK Airport at 4 in the afternoon and has an appointment in central Manhattan at 7.30 p.m. She wants to know... Is it feasible to reach an event at Madison Square Garden the same evening? My accommodation in New York is a 15-minute cab ride from the venue. 
With New York's JFK Airport just 12 miles from Manhattan, on paper there should be no problem covering that distance in over three hours. But a recent snapshot of wait times for US Customs and Border Protection at the airport's International Arrivals Terminal shows that the average wait for non-Americans between 4 and 5 p.m. was 33 minutes, with a maximum of 70 minutes. You can avoid such problems by choosing a departure airport in Europe such as Dublin, which has US pre-clearance. All the immigration checks take place on foreign soil. Next, getting to Manhattan. The evening rush hour will be building on the roads, so I suggest you go for the rail option. Even with a long wait for border checks, you should reach Penn Station by around 6 p.m. If you're running short of time, you might want to check your bags into left luggage and then grab a bite to eat before the gig. That's all for now, but please keep sending me your travel problems and I'll do my best to find you solutions. Bye for now. And to finish the week, we're in Japan to see Carmen take on another challenge as she prepares to take on the sights and sounds of Osaka against the clock. For the first time ever, the Rugby World Cup heads to Asia next year. 400,000 sports fans will go and see their teams at 10 host cities around Japan in what's also a dry run for the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. Some, though, will be worried about Japan's reputation as a place that's tricky to get around if you don't speak the language. And it's a myth that I think is not always deserved. And to show you why, I'll be exploring six of the host cities against the clock. So today, we're in Osaka. It used to be a logistical hub for the ancient capital, which was Kyoto. And um, it has a very distinct culture of its own. It has its own food, it has its own dialect. So much so that um, it's competing a lot with Tokyo. It's like, the, some say it's the western capital of Japan. So there's that east versus west kind of thing going on. I've got to walk there. No, that way. The challenge is this. I've got 90 minutes, the length of a rugby match plus half time, to see its three big highlights. And what have you got in store for me today? What's my challenge? All right, so for today, you are going to go three places. Um, we have something to see, something to eat, and then a little curveball at the end. My first stop is at a building that dominates the skyline here. So this is it. This is where my challenge starts. Let's start the clock right now. So Umeda Sky Building is a landmark tower here in Osaka. It has a 40th floor observatory where you can enjoy the view of the city. And the escalator itself is between two buildings, so you can enjoy the city view while you're going up. So this is the famous mid-air escalator. What a magnificent view. So the view is even more spectacular at the rooftop observatory, but unfortunately it is currently closed due to the damage from the recent typhoon, which was the biggest in recent decades. Is this the famous highway that runs through the building? I've seen this. Like, it's world famous. Thank you. Okay, so to get to the next location, I've got to catch a train. There is nothing worse than arriving at a Japanese train station in a panic. Okay, so I've got to calm down. Look at all these lines. Oh my goodness. So Umeda Station has a few stations by the same name, which goes different places. And also there are many signages, there are a lot of people there at any given time, and there's so many exits and entrances, which makes it a really difficult challenge. Okay, we're good, we're good. So we're here at Umeda Station, and I need to get to Namba. Okay, Mido Suji line it is. So it's easier than you might think getting around on the metro or the subway here because a lot of the signs are now in Japanese, Korean, English, even Chinese, um, particularly in big cities like Tokyo and Osaka. So Carmen is going to come out into the Dotonbori district 
and she's gonna try a local delicacy called takoyaki, which are octopus balls. Okay, I think I see the giant octopus. This has to be it. Oh my goodness, look at the line. It's huge. Must be good. I think they have their own theme song too. So takoyaki is a quintessentially Osakan food. It was invented here in Osaka. And they have bits of octopus inside a batter. So I've got my takoyaki. What an experience just lining up and waiting for the takoyaki. <laughs> so now on to the next task. Now I'm looking for a Ferris wheel. Time is ticking. <laughs> An hour and seven minutes has passed, so I have 21 minutes. Ferris wheel. Doko desu ka? Hai. Masugu? Hai. Arigato. Okay, she said it straight ahead. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Is that it? I think we found it. <laughs> we were really, really close. <laughs> this wheel, mounted onto the outside of a discount store, is a bit of a local landmark. It's thought to be the world's only oval Ferris wheel. Okay, we're here. It's been out of action for almost the last 10 years and has only just been restored to its former glory. I'm here, I made it. That's my whistle stop tour of Osaka with roughly 10 minutes to spare. What a way to finish the day. That was Carmen reporting from Japan. And we'll be back there next week when she embarks on another 90-minute challenge, this time in the Japanese port city of Kobe. Wow, look at that. Oh my goodness, what a view. So do join us then if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can sign up to our social media feeds and see where we are in the world, as well as sharing some of your own travel stories. But for now, from me, Crystal Arwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in the Lake District, it's goodbye.